nor the honorable mentions, nor even easily found online, was that 8,000 Nigerian Christians were slaughtered brutally since January. Uh, Fulani herdsmen have been rounding up whole villages and digging pits and killing all the people and pushing their bodies into the pits. And it is because they are Christians. Has anyone heard about that in the papers? Think about this. How much media do we get when a handful of people die in a terror attack, say, up the coast? It's all over the place. This is 8,000 people. But it seems that our media does not handle um, Christian suffering very well, nor even does it mention it. Well, are we surprised to hear that? Are we surprised to hear that Christians still suffer? If we're believing, if we're to believe statistics, one in every 12 Christians lives somewhere where it is illegal, punishable, and forbidden to believe in Jesus Christ. One in every 12. 280 million Christians a year are under threat of punishment for being a Christian. It shouldn't be too surprising. And even less surprising is that when we turn to God's word, he seems to imply that this is absolutely expected. Here's one, Jesus. Take up your cross daily and follow after me. Well, what is your cross? That's the thing that you are crucified on. Uh, Peter, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among us as if something strange were happening. The testing of your faith, it's here. He also says, uh, arm yourself with the same purpose. For the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Paul, all who desire to live uprightly in this world will have, what's the word? Anybody? Trouble, persecution, trouble, difficulty. That's 1 Timothy 3.12. Uh, so what surprises us here is actually the norm, is actually expected, is actually what God told us is going to happen. And yet, for all of that, doesn't it seem so far away? Isn't that something that we think maybe that was just for the first century? They had a whole go into the Colosseum thing going, and now we don't have that anymore. We're, we're modern. We're never going to suffer for our faith. But the Bible might be saying otherwise. Uh, and so we find the church of Smyrna. Smyrna, right? It sounds like myrrha, which happens to be the word mir or mirth, which is what you put on a dead body to make it smell at least a little bit more pleasing. This is what you would have gotten from that word hearing it. And it's in a load of trouble. And there's the stench of death upon that church. And people are worried and concerned. And Jesus himself pens a letter to them. And the letter says, I've heard of what you're going through but I've decided not to just make it all better. Some of you will suffer. Some of you will be persecuted. Many of you will die. Hold on. You'll see me at the end. <laughs> Can you imagine receiving such a letter from God to you? I've decided not to intervene here. Some of you will suffer. Some of you will be persecuted. Many of you will die. Hold on. And so we're being asked to have an entirely different view about what it means to be a disciple of Christ and what it means to follow Christ. And I have down here our big idea for the day. Saving faith suffers. Saving faith suffers. So stand firm. Saving faith suffers. So stand firm. Now, let me show you what I mean. Let's consider... Firstly, the extravagance of the poorly, the extravagance of the poorly. Sometimes those who physically look uh, like they've done bad, they've done poorly, they're, they're not rich, they're not wealthy, uh, the, the reverse, they're actually rich spiritually. They're actually the important ones. And, and the worse off, those who are, are suffering, they're the winners. So let's, let's read verse 8. 
to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. So Jesus Jesus starts off with the statement, I am the the first and the last. And what that means is, I'm not only the first and the last, I'm every little bit in between. I am what this is about. This is my story. Now, this is a great principle for our lives. If you get to that moment and you're like, wait, life doesn't make sense. It didn't go the way I wanted it to. It went down this road. It went down that road. How could you let this happen? God's response in some sense is, this isn't your story. It's mine. This story is about me, and your part in it is making me known, making my love known. The story from first to last, it's about Christ. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than our lives. It's bigger than what we do or don't do. We all play a part in it. We're not the hero. Jesus is. Jesus is. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about us. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It says all things work together for those who are uh, called according to God's purpose, who love the Lord, right? Uh, so God does love us, and yet this is about him making this king known. Well, then what does he follow up with? I was dead. I know that's how he goes there immediately. I was dead, and then I lived. Um, Smyrna had been dead. The, the city had. Uh, the city uh, had had this tremendous earthquake hit it. And it just, it fell to bits. There was nothing left. There was nothing left to reconstruct. They just kicked around the sand and it stayed the sand and it stayed like that for 200 years, okay? <laughs> like no one's gonna rebuild this place. And then it came to life again. The Romans revived it. It became this kind of the center for emperor worship, which is why things are about to get very, very difficult, by the way. Um, <laughs> it, it lived again. So Jesus said, I died and came to life. And when you're in a city, where it's been dead and it came to life, what do you think I'm about to ask you to do? <laughs> Maybe two, two will die and rise. Maybe that's what I ask of you. Maybe that's what I put before you. Wow, that is the most unchristian sounding thing I could say, isn't it? I have a purpose for you. Die and live again. It's just the sort of thing that we would not go to church seeking, right? <laughs> that we don't want to hear. And yet, actually, real faith looks like this. You know, when we see Christ on the cross for believers, that's not just a a theological fact. We are his disciples. We go there. Even if we don't actually have to die for our faith, even if we don't actually have to go to that extreme, yet our life, is to look like the life of someone who suffers to save others, who lowers themselves before others, who lets people walk over them for the sake of the kingdom, just like Jesus did. It's not just theology. Well, look at uh, verse 9 here. I know your affliction and your poverty, You're rich, yet you're rich. So here we have poverty, and it's actually, it's coming directly out of their faith. Like you have faith, therefore you have no money. (laughs) You have no no bank here. And and this in itself is, is worth pondering here. You might have heard from a preacher somewhere that if you now give, just right now, if you just now give a little bit of money, well, 77 fold, my friend, in a couple of months, Maybe even faster, depending on how fast you give, right? (laughs) This church is following Christ, and the direct result of following Christ is they're broke. They have no money. They haven't done anything wrong. It's not that they don't have enough faith. It's that they have faith, and the answer is, now you will have nothing. And that's the state of the church. Well, what happened here? Well, uh, the city Smyrna loved emperor worship. Uh, And part of that was, as a a normal citizen, you were expected to light incense incense to Caesar as Lord and God. Lord and God. You were to worship him as deity. And then you were to worship the Roman uh, pantheon. And by doing thus, you were saying, I'm well disposed to be a patriotic citizen of this country. 
Okay, that's, that's how you said, I followed the rules. By lighting the incense, declaring Caesar, Lord and God, and worshiping the Pantheon, and the Christians couldn't do this. And so immediately, they're looked at as rebellious and sedacious, right? What are you guys doing there? Um, and, and they're looked at as uh, people that you shouldn't do business with, people that aren't good for your country, don't associate with them, don't buy with them, uh, don't talk to them. Those people are tricky. Those people are troublemakers. And so now they're poor, and they're dwelling in a very difficult place. And along comes Jesus, and he says, I'm so sorry, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fix this immediately. You'll get your wealth back, you'll get your riches back, you'll get your friends back, you'll be respected by all. Is that, is that what Jesus says here? No, he says, you are rich. You are rich. This isn't to be shunned. This isn't to be something to be afraid of, this situation that you found yourself in. The true thing is, even though you look poor, the reality is this is exactly where you want to be. That's what he says. You are rich. Are you suffering for your faith? You're doing it right. Are you not suffering for your faith? You're not doing it right. Are, are you not suffering for your faith? Maybe your faith is the kind of faith that doesn't lead to suffering. Maybe what you suffer from is a lack of faith. Because you're not even making a ripple enough for Satan to come after you and to give you trouble and to give you a bit of worry because it's not even a big deal to him. He just leaves you alone. That, that, that kind of faith isn't the kind that changes lives. Life is not about avoiding suffering. Life is about living for Christ, even if suffering comes. So um, <laughs> to illustrate this, I went and, got, and played basketball the other day with a couple of other Christian friends of mine. Great time. We had such a wonderful time playing basketball. Uh, and uh, when we got there, there were other people there that were not Christians. We could tell they weren't Christians because of their colorful language. So anyway, we had a nice time playing with them. Uh, and as time went on, uh, we got to the end. Uh, I was just happy that I made it uh, through that, I was exhausted and remembering that I was nearly 40 and that these people were mostly in their 20s. Um, <laughs> and um, as we're sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I just want to establish communication with this new group of friends that I've made and make sure they know that I'm a normal guy. And then maybe somewhere a long ways away in the future, I might tell them that I'm a pastor, okay? But not now. I got to build rapport, you know, and I got to make sure all this is going good so that I, I can, you know, they won't really hate me when I actually tell them that I'm a Christian at the end. And then the two friends of mine immediately destroyed the whole thing. They were like, we believe in Jesus. They both did their own thing, actually, at the same time. And I was right next to one of them, and there was another one in the corner, and I was like, ah, you know, and it was great work that was being done, but there goes my credibility. There goes all my honor and my glory. And I was like, oh, I'm humiliated. And, and I bet you some of the people who uh, we shared with, actually, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we do think these guys are idiots. And all the more power to the boldness of which those guys proclaimed the gospel. May we be like that, not caring about how people are going to react, but sharing the love boldly of Christ. Daring to be losers for Jesus. The very thing that we're afraid of every time we go to share the gospel, the very thing that we're afraid of every time we say to our friends who know us anything about Jesus, it's like they're saying, please don't tell me, I will mistreat you. <laughs> and so we don't. God says, speak up. Speak up. Now, uh, let's take a look at this uh, synagogue of Satan here in verse 9b. Uh, I know the slander. Um, of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Of the synagogue of Satan. So uh, this is not anti-Semitic. Uh, the entire Bible, almost all of it, is written by Jewish people. Okay. Uh, so what are we trying to understand? What what is going on here? Uh, let's start with the word synagogue. There, actually, the word synagogue is kind of more used to mean synagogue later in time. Okay. It actually just means assembly. It's used of non-Christians and Christians in the New Testament. Um, and then further, what's really going on is this unfortunate situation. Judaism had a pass with Rome. They didn't have to light incense and uh, worship Caesar as God. Uh, they could simply declare their allegiance to him, and that was enough. Okay? But, and, and the early Christians, they had that pass too. 
because Judaism is actually, Christianity is actually just Judaism with the Messiah. You see how that works? The Messiah has come, that's great. Uh, but as time went on, some Jewish people, and particularly here in Smyrna, uh, said, oh, those people are not us. Those people should not have our pass. Those people, they don't belong to us. Those guys, they're out. We don't even know what they're saying. That's dangerous. And so essentially, some of the Jewish people in the city ratted out the Christians. They, no, no, we, we don't know those guys. <laughs> okay? And this led to literally people dying. It, it really did. Uh, they were taken, and you know, you don't belong to this, and now you need to declare to Caesar, if you don't, you're a rebel. And uh, you can read about them getting uh, murdered for this in Pliny, if you're interested, okay? Uh, so this is what took place. And so yes, these people specifically who are doing this are ethnically Jewish. But in another sense, they don't stand for anything that Judaism stands for. They don't stand for worshiping the one God. They're stopping people from doing so. They're resisting God's plan. And so God says of them, you're not Jewish. Okay, but that's just them, you see. Okay, that's not all Jewish people. We've kind of got a problem in our history on this one. If you want to read about some really tragic things, look at what the church has done to the Jewish people. And for goodness sakes, what's the truth of the matter? The truth is the matter is more and more Jewish people are coming to know Yeshua, Jesus as their Messiah. I dare say that a few of them might be amongst us. All right. Saving faith suffers, so let's stand firm. If you have any more questions about that, by the way, feel free to ask me later. So saving faith suffers, so stand firm. Okay, so we've seen through, uh, though Christians are sometimes poorly outwardly, downcast and suffering, in reality, they are rich and their suffering serves a purpose. Now let's consider how the conquered are conquering. So we should stand. Let's read verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life, or the crown, the victor's crown is your life. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. So the first thing that uh, we have, the first command in our section, it's good to remember the commands that we have in uh, Revelation in particular. Remember it says, blessed are those who keep the words that are here. So we're looking for commands. Remember we had behold, behold Christ in his glory. And then we had turn and do the things that you did at first. And now we have a third command. Don't be uh, afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm telling you in advance. Okay, so uh, normally the things that we're afraid of it, are attached to what is unknown because we like to control things, don't we? We like to have control of every little thing and here's something that we don't have control of and that scares us. And so he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You will suffer, <laughs> okay? That is your lot. I'm telling you ahead of time. This is where it's going. You will suffer for your faith. And that's kind of like, uh, it, it, there's a heart surgeon, uh, and he would tell his patients right before the surgery, listen, I'm about to do the surgery on you, and after the surgery is over, the next two weeks after you recover, you're going to be so depressed. I, I dare say you'll be suicidal. That's what most people go through. You're going to be so depressed, you're going to be so suicidal, but it's just actually a physiological thing. You're going to be okay in the end. I'm telling you in advance so you know when it happens that this is the sort of thing that will happen and it'll be okay. And sure enough, this is what people would go through and they would say, okay, here I am feeling terrible. I know I'm feeling terrible. It's because I've been told this is what's going to happen. And so we must arm ourselves with that same thing. Now look at the things that he tells us. We're going to be thrown in prison, he says, to the church in Smyrna. And prison in those days wasn't a happy place primarily because, well, you couldn't leave just like prison today, but they also didn't feed you. They're like, you're a prisoner. Why should we give you money to live? So if you had a rich friend or some people that cared about you, they would bring you food. And if not, this was going to be a short prison sentence, okay? This is not a good situation. And he says, you will be tested. And we must understand this about God. God intends to test our faiths. 
God intends to show that our faith in him is sincere. And when you test metal, what do you do? You put it through the fire. It goes through. And sure enough, there's verses that say things like, when you walk through the fire, not you will never walk through the fire, but when you walk through the fire. You know, if we go through life thinking that Christianity is here to make us feel more comfortable, we're going to just be sorely disappointed and we're not going to have faith. Something is going to go wrong and then we're going to go to our pastor or to somebody and we're going to say, I no longer believe in God. Why? Because he let me down. God isn't telling us that it's going to be great. God is telling us it's not going to be great. I will test your faith. I will bring you through the fire. And that's actually what we want. It's actually what we want. Now, it says here 10 days. What does that mean? You'll be tested for 10 days. Well, it could be just a short period of time. But it just so happens, uh, we talked about Smyrna as a big church, a uh, big, big city where they worship the emperor. And every year for 10 days, in honor of the emperor, they would have the Colosseum Games. They would have the Colosseum Games. Ten days of degradation, forced execution, glorified murder. Ten days to stand before a crowd whose only request of you is that you would be obliterated in an entertaining way. Ten days of humiliation. Christ says, just a short time this life, give it to me. I'll give you the crown of life. I'll give you the crown. And so God doesn't, he upfront asks you, suffer, suffer to the point of death. You can't do more than die, can you? <laughs> That's all you have, your life. Jesus says, give me all you have. Give me everything. Don't hold back. Suffer all the way. Give everything to me. That's the sort of faith that saves. That's the sort of faith that we're called to. Not a partial commitment. Not a, I stayed two days. I stayed six days in the call scene. I stayed nine days in the call scene. None of those work. I stayed. I gave everything. I surrendered all of it. That's the kind of faith that God says he wants from us. That's the kind of call that he puts upon us. And that's the only kind that matters. So we must have that kind of faith, shouldn't we? God asks for everything. But look how the Christian conquers. The Christian conquers not by having a jihad, right, and going and killing everybody who disagrees with him, the Christian conquers by letting those who disagree with him persecute him, hurt him, maybe even kill him or her. The Christian conquers by dying just like Jesus died. Suffering and serving, loving. You know what happens when people see that? All of their excuses fall to the ground. You cannot fight the argument of someone who will love you no matter what the cost. And this is what wins the world over. And this is the victory. It is our faith, a faith that says life isn't about life. Life is about Jesus. And I don't mind if my life is short to make him known. I'll do that. Now check this out. It says the one who conquers, it doesn't say the one who tried a bit. It doesn't say the one who gave some of his heart, but not all of it. It says the one who conquers, I will, they will by no means ever be touched by the second death. They'll never, ever be touched by the second death. Now, these people are coming and they are threatening a first death. That's what they're doing. If you don't agree with us, if you're not modern and enlightened and go with what we're saying then, then we're going to persecute you. Then we're going to cause you to suffer. Then we may even kill you. We'll take your first death for sure. But if you think about it, everyone's going to have a first death no matter what. We're all going to have a first death. That, that is guaranteed. One way or another, we're all going to go. That's not the death that matters. The death that matters is the one that's coming, the second death. That's the whole 
That's the whole story. The second death is coming. And in Christ, we have life, life forever, life never ending. It's so much better than getting the first death in another 30 years. <laughs> it's so much better than getting a momentary pleasure and then dying and just being lost and away from Christ. That's the real problem. And that's where all the people who are persecuting us may be going. And us laying down our lives before them might spare them. They might see it and turn and find hope. And so we have this confidence. Yes, we may be losing our life. Yes, we may be suffering intensely, but we have a reward. You're rich. You're rich. So that's our message. Saving faith really must suffer. It must. It must. So let's stand firm knowing what's coming. Uh, I wanted to end on um, Jim Elliott's uh, quote. You've probably heard it. Um, let me give you a background. Jim Elliott has decided to go and do mission work in South America. And uh, he just has raised all this money. It's taken a long time. There's been lots of preparation. And he gets down there and he basically meets the tribe for the very first time and they kill him. And a week before, he writes in his diary, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. That is what we have before us. God says, come and die. Come and be like Christ to this world. Become forgiven, become like me, suffer, maybe even die, and I will give you life. You know what is interesting about that story? His wife, who's written several books, and they're really very decent, his wife then goes back to this tribe, and the whole area meets the Lord. What a story. That's what I want on my tombstone. Is that what you want? So in a moment, we're going to pray. And I have a very specific thing that I'd like you to pray. Uh, so much application here. Here's the application. I am willing. Will you say that to God? I am willing to suffer. I am willing to die. I am willing to go and do what you have asked me to do. I am willing to be persecuted. I am willing to take it. I am willing. I surrender. Will you pray that?